Hey everyone, it's me, Josh, and for this week's uh, SYSK Selects, I chose Lion Taming. Um, this one came from our Summer of Sam, uh, chosen by Sam T. Garden, who went on to become Sam the Intern, who will probably go on to become Sam the House Stuff Works employee at some point. Um, and I want you to take particular note of the segment where we talk about how the Simpsons are known to predict the future. It's an excellent example of how connected our episodes are across the years. That, or it's an example of us later unwittingly rehashing info we've already covered. Uh, at any rate, it's a good episode about an interesting topic, so I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Uh, this is Stuff You Should Know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, Josh, is another episode of The Summer of Sam. Our, our Oh, this kid is good. Yeah, our friend Sam uh, Teagarden is yeah. programming our show here and there. Hey, Sam. And uh, Sam sent in How Lion Taming Works, which is also written by Debbie uh, Ronka, my buddy. Yeah. From New Jersey. Yep. Roller Derby Debbie, mm-hmm. as I call her. I don't call her that. No, you don't? I call her Deb. She's okay. my old friend. If I call her Roller Derby Debbie. You did it perfectly the first time. <laughs> yeah. Roller Derby Debbie. That would just get difficult. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, right on. This one's just going to be great then. Because there's a good article too. That's right. And you can read Debbie's awesome <clears throat> blog at freakgirl.com. <laughs> That's quite a plug. Thank you. Um, and then where are we at with Sam? So Sam has now selected uh, how lion taming works. What was the first one? Uh, I can't remember. It was a couple of weeks ago. He's done two. Man, it was awesome. But we actually recorded a couple that he had not heard yet that he also had on his list. Oh, good. Just by chance. Are we going to attribute those to him? No. Just just the ones that we saw afterward. But uh, anyway, thanks, Sam. This is a good one. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well put, Chuck. Thank you. Um, well, let's see. Uh I have a, a bit of an intro. Have you ever heard the idea that the Simpsons have a tendency to predict the future? Uh, no. Okay. Well, let me enlighten you. All right. Um, there was an episode called um, Homer, H-O-M-R, season 12, episode 9. Excellent episode. It's where Homer, um, basically, they find out that Homer has a crayon st- stuck in his brain. A what? A crayon? A crayon. Yeah, I remember. From that. childhood. Yeah. And they, re- they remove it, and his IQ just immediately doubles. Classic. In 2007, years after Homer, um, a German lady, age 59, um, was going to get surgery to cure her chronic headaches. Mm-hmm. They found a pencil that was stuck up there from childhood. That she stuck up there? Yeah. Wow. When she was a kid. Uh-huh. And apparently forgot. <laughs> they found, they, they removed the pencil. She's fine. People are wacky. Yeah, but... But isn't that weird? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, here's another one. Let me see what you think about this. Um, Homer uh, in the Treehouse of Horror uh, 19. Ooh, definitely didn't see that one. Really? Nah, I quit watching it after a certain point. <clears throat> That's season 20. Okay. Um, he goes to vote for Obama on election day, and the, um, well, it's it's a takeoff of Di- Diebold, the, the um, voting machines. Yeah. That had so many problems. Yeah, yeah. He goes to vote for... Um, Obama, and instead it starts voting a bunch of times for McCain. Uh Okay, so the next, I guess that year, a woman from West Virginia said that she checked the box next to Obama, and it just automatically switched over to McCain. Really? This is after this thing came out, okay? which would mean it's predicting. Probably most chilling is um, comes from Springfield, with the S spelled as the dollar sign. Mm -hmm. The subtitle is... Or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Legalized Gambling. Season 5, Episode 10, Springfield Gets a Casino. I remember Mr. Burns one. Casino. Great mm-hmm. one. Yeah. And in it are two characters who are obviously based on Siegfried and Roy. Yeah. And they're with their white tiger, Anastasia. Yeah. She loves the city, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Anastasia um, uh, flashes back to when she was caught in the wild by Siegfried and Roy. Uh-huh. We shot her with a tranquilizer gun and um, spits out her little bubble pipe and her little uh, beanie and attacks one of them. Yeah. This is a full 10 years before <laughs> the attack of Roy Horn in 2003 during a show at the Mirage in Las Vegas where um, one of their white tigers uh, attacked him. Montecor attacked 
Roy. That's right. And basically just ended their career right then. Yeah, I think on that one, like if you're going to write a Simpsons episode aping sick Green Roy, what else are they going to do? You're going to have the lion eat him. Okay. Or the tiger, I'm sorry. You raise an excellent point here, Chuck. But it's still remarkable. It is. But you raise a very good point. And the point is, um, I think everybody who sees someone interacting with the tamest wild animal you could possibly imagine mm-hmm. still will not be surprised if that animal kills the person. Yeah. Because, as Jack Hanna put it, very um, appropriately, I think, and Jack Hanna, he was uh, the original Steve Irwin, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Um he said, uh, you can train a wild animal, but you can never tame a wild animal. And that's a really big, important point in the world of, I guess, lion taming. Yeah, and another famous <clears throat> lion trainer slash tamer, we're going to probably interchange those words, yeah. said, you can't tame a lion because if you did, that there would be no act. Yeah, okay. Like part, of the, part of the act and part of the thrill of this for people is the fact that these are wild beasts. And if it was just, if it was a penguin, right. it wouldn't be very exciting. No, it wouldn't. Although, I'd like to see that. A trained penguin? Well, yeah, putting your mouth in it, a head in its mouth and <laughs> cracking the whip. That'd be fun. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> um, it would be really mind-blowing if the penguin was dressed like a lion tamer and you were treating it like a lion. <laughs> uh, okay, I've got another lion tamer quote for you then, smart guy. All right. Gunther uh, Gebel Williams. Yeah, he was the one I saw growing up. Okay. At the Ringling Brothers. He said, a wild animal is like a loaded gun. It can go off at any time. Yeah. So let's end the intro with that. Okay. Let's talk about lion taming. You you brought up a really good point, Chuck. Um, uh, the If you are in this world these days, mm-hmm. it's not lion tamer, it's lion trainer. Yeah. Or wild animal t- trainer. Yes. Because none of these people think that they have a tame animal on their hands. No, it's sort of the hubris of some of these early jerks. Um that we'll talk about right now. Uh, 1819 was kind of when it all got going. Yeah. A uh, Frenchman named Henri Martin. Um, yeah, hey to our French listener. <laughs> he was a retired horse trainer, and he thought, you know what, I'm going to try and work with a tiger, which is very different uh, than what anyone's ever seen before. And he had a method where he worked himself into the cage little by little, like, just my presence, then I'll stick an arm in, mm-hmm. then I'll stick my head in. Take a couple of scratches. Yeah, here and there. And then eventually he found himself earning the trust of the big cats over time, and he would find himself uh, completely in the cage. So he was the first uh, first dude, period, I think. First American. He was the first known what you would call lion tamer. Yeah. First American uh, was a guy named Isaac Van Amberg, mm-hmm. and he was around in 1833, and he was what I meant when I said jerks, because he would apparently like beat these cats with crowbars and uh, use very violent tactics. Yeah, and he he had a uh, pretty good um, excuse for it or um, justification, <laughs> didn't he? Was that sarcasm? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he was he was uh, a biblical guy, and he would actually act out biblical scenes with these uh, animals. And his big defense was uh, Genesis one twenty six. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over everything creeping that creepeth upon the earth. Creep, creep. And I just like the Bible saying creepeth. Yeah. (laughs) It's pretty cool. And it just kind of goes on. It's like really, it's one big one run on sentence and you can't help but wonder um, if Van Amberg would say the whole thing. Or he'd just be like, just read Genesis 126. Yeah, his big, uh, his finishing move was sort of insult to injury after he would do all this stuff. And of course, he's not beating them with a crowbar in front of people. But apparently, that's how he trained them to begin with, out of fear and injury. And uh, he would uh, finish his shows by making the lions lick his boots. Oh, man, what a jerk. I know, after all that, after suffering at his hands. You know what would have been awesome would be to see the steam man of the prairie beat the tar out of Van Amberg. <laughs> yeah. You can reference our exoskeleton cast for that one. Right? Yeah. All right. Um, have you seen Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control? Uh, no. Is that about robots? Ooh, you got to see that. It's Errol Morris documentary, and it was about a, uh, a topiary gardener, a robot uh, scientist, and a uh, lion tamer, uh-huh. and how all these things sort of intertwined. Oh, there was one more, a mole rat specialist. 
And in the movie, Dave Hoover was the lion tamer. And Errol Morris also worked in, because Hoover was a huge fan of Clyde Beatty. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Errol Morris worked in this old black and white footage, and Clyde Beatty was almost the fifth character of that documentary. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's really, really great. Okay, I have a really good um, wild animal tamer uh, documentary. All right, let's hear it. Um, Yumi introduced me to this one. It's called Cat Dancers. Have you heard of it? No. Oh, my gosh. It is it's so heartbreaking. It's ridiculous. Really? It's about this group of people who like have their own thing going on and um, love one another and love their big cats. Uh-huh. And then just things keep going wrong. Oh, really? It's a really great documentary. It's one of the best I've ever seen in my entire life. Wow. You I'll, know, I'm going to throw see. this one out there, too. It's one of my favorites. So. Okay, go ahead. No, fast, cheap, and out of control. Oh, okay. Oh, well, there. It's both on the table. It's crazy, though, that this podcast <laughs> features two of our favorite documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, and Cat Dancers. Look for a quiz question on that one. And you can get those on Netflix. Exactly. <laughs> so Clyde Beatty, who was Dave Hoover's hero, was around in the 1920s. Um, he used a pistol and a whip Yeah. Uh, to keep things in line. And I think the pistol was like a, a sound scare, sure. less than like a threatening thing. <laughs> right. You, you go through a lot of yeah. lions shooting him in the chest. That's right. It gets expensive. But he was performing at this... Um, <clears throat> At this, the peak of this um, lion tamer is, you think of an old timey lion yeah. tamer. Um, the the peak of the appreciation from the public, sure. Because a lot of these guys they shaped the public expectations, but they were also responding to them. Yeah, and the public has had a role in shaping uh, how lion tamers, lion trainers, um, interact with their cats. And Beatty was kind of the last of the pistol shooting whip crack in chair guys the old guy yeah uh hoover actually explains the chair and mm. debbie's right on the money yeah. um if you've ever wondered why they point a chair at a lion it's because apparently these big cats have a have a one track mind or they're single minded and so the four points uh of the chair legs confuse it yeah and uh that's what hoover said so i believe it well that's awesome yeah <laughs> um so you've got Henri Martin, who starts everything out um, mm-hmm. very gently, using trust, yeah, um, and basically just exposing himself to these large cats. He did trust falls, right, and the cat would catch him, right. Yeah, um, and uh, then you have um, Van Amberg coming along, Isaac Van Amberg, uh, basically just beating the tar out of these things, yeah, and using a very different method, fear. And Clyde Beatty kind of uh, carries that torch. And then after Beatty, things change. And you have modern lion trainers like Siegfried and Roy, uh, Gunther Gebel Williams. Is that how you say his name? Yeah. You're the German speaker. Uh, Gunther Gebel Williams. Williams. Oh. <laughs> he just made my eye bleed. Yeah, he, uh, like I said, he was the one like that was very big in like the 70s and 80s when I was growing up. Right, and apparently he was in an American Express commercial. Oh, yeah? Yeah, with a um, uh, leopard hanging over him. The don't leave home without it days, probably? I would imagine. Yeah. Um, but uh, so you you have the, then you have this kind of transition to the modern lion trainer, which was actually a circle back to the the beginning. A little more genteel. Well, not just that. It's like using trust. Yeah. Not using beatings. Yeah. Um, and, and basically just spending time with your animal to let it get to know you. Yeah, and the whip they use, even if you see a whip these days, they're not whipping the animal. The whip is to just to sort of like, hey, this is my space, this is your space. Yeah, my space is over here. Exactly. Your space is over there. So let's talk about the psychology of all this stuff. Yeah? Animal psychology. And people psychology. Why not? Because it's really not that much different. Uh, B.F. Skinner is a person psychologist, a very famous one. Yeah, he created the Skinner box. That's right. And, raises uh, children in it. Oh, uh, was that what's-his-face? Huh? I don't know. I thought you were talking about the kid that was kept in isolation. Arthur? 
Oh, um, Baby Albert. Albert. No, no, no. That's totally different. Okay. That was um, fear extinction that they were studying. Gotcha. This is conditioning that okay. Skinner was all about. Um, so operant conditioning is what we're talking about, and that's basically uh, connecting a behavior with a signal um, and giving the animal a reward. Yeah. It's like it's pretty much a one, two, three cycle. Yeah. It's it's basically saying, like, um, you did something that's any, even remotely close to what I want you to do, yeah. so here's some food. And now you, you have them. the animal's attention. Yeah. Like, oh, where did that come from? Right. Like, now um, you kind of shape that behavior where it's like, you know, come on, let's let's try turning to the right. And then if they move to the right, they get a little bit of food. And maybe if they turn all the way to the right, they get a bunch of food. Yeah. Um, and then you have, say, you're leading them with a stick. Yeah. Um, so eventually you remove the stick and replace it with something like a snap or a clap. Yeah. Or, or hey, up. Yes. <laughs> you hear a lot of that. And all of a sudden you have an animal that can turn in a circle when you do what you just did. That's right. And that's called classical conditioning. Well, it starts with operant and moves into classical conditioning. Operant, then capturing, then shaping, then classical conditioning. And capturing and shaping are part of operant. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should we talk about Christian the Lion, I guess? I don't see how we can't. It is real, people. If you've seen this on the YouTube, it is not made up. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Like, you realize what you're saying here, man. Dude, <laughs> it's as real as, like, anything in history that happened. Okay. Like, I've seen the documentary about it. What and it and I don't think it was Christopher Guest who directed it. <laughs> uh, I can't remember the name of it. Christian the Lion, something like that. Um, you've seen it on YouTube in 19, uh, the 1969, late 60s. Um, a couple of Aussies, John Rindell and Ace Bork, uh, bought a, a lion from a department store in London. Harrods. Didn't know they sold lions back then. Harrods does. Really? Yeah. And it was sort of the hit of London at the time. It was like the swinging 60s. And these dudes were known for having this lion and like throwing parties and stuff. It was like pretty cool. And, uh, the lion got bigger, of course, and they had to release it into the wild uh, with the help of the born free people. And then there's, of course, the famous video where they went um, to visit this lion. Uh, like, was it years later? It was uh, 1973 or two, I think. 1972. I'm not sure when they released him, but it was it was quite a while later. And the it was well, a few years. The lion jumps up and like hugs the guys. It was amazing. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. Are you sure it's real? <laughs> I'm as sure that that's real is that you're real huh otherwise the biggest hoax has been pulled over the world yeah, i don't history. know about that i think the howard hughes biography was topped christian yeah that was lion. pretty good yeah. yeah um but as debbie points out for every christian the lion there's a sick reed and roy yes which we already kind of covered but i think we should go a little more into it yeah there's some different theories out there so in 2003 they were um Siegfried and Roy were doing their thing, and apparently they had like, th I think three thousand of these performances under their belts already. Yeah, they were working with Manticore or Montecore, sorry, mm -hmm. um, who was one of their tigers, um, who they'd raised from a cub, and he was now seven years old. Um, so they knew this this tiger intimately, like they were its parents for all intents and purposes. Yeah, and that's one of the keys too with lion taming is that you raise them from a cub. They're not going out and getting these tigers from the savanna that are grown yeah. and then taming them. So the Simpsons were wrong in that respect. Sure. But um, so during this performance, uh, something happened. Um, Montecore grabbed Roy um, by his windpipe mm -hmm. and dragged him off stage. From the outset, um, Roy, by the way, is now partially paralyzed and has a crushed trachea yeah. because of this. But from the outset, from the moment he regained consciousness, Roy said, do not destroy Montecore. He yeah. was like, he something happened. He wasn't trying to hurt me. He was trying to protect me. Yeah. And he was just dragging me away from whatever it was. Roy suggested that possibly he had a stroke and that freaked out the tiger. Yeah. The tiger picked up on it. Um, it's also been theorized that a woman... This is almost like the lone gunman theory. Actually, this is the one I believe. A woman with a beehive hairdo mm -hmm. sitting toward the front row, or possibly in the front row, 
was like distracted and confused the tiger. Yeah. Um, which I guess maybe the, the tiger was trying to get Roy away from the beehive. Well, what happened, the accounts I read is that this tiger became transfixed on this lady uh-huh. and like started walking toward the lady. Uh-huh. And so, uh, Roy jumped in between them and, uh, the the tiger uh, grabbed a hold of his wrist at this point, uh-huh. and Roy bopped him on the nose with a microphone. Was going release, release, uh-huh. and he released him, and he fell backward at that point. And I think that's when the tiger, or the the tiger, I keep on saying lion. That's when he thought that Roy was in trouble because it was a big brouhaha all of a sudden with him falling over. Yeah. People rushed out there in the confusion. They think that he grabbed him like you would grab a baby kitten around the neck right. to pull it off stage. Yeah. So that's, I, I believe that. That sounds sensible. But he didn't let go. <laughs> like they sprayed him with this fire extinguisher and they beat him with a fire extinguisher mm-hmm. until he let go and um, cut his, uh, what do you call it? The uh, windpipe. Yeah, no, but the the bleeder. The, uh, the jugular? The jugular. Yeah. Well, Roy's still alive. He survived. Um, and they, they actually um, had a final performance in 2009 six years later with montecore with montecore yeah because he's still alive yep um and he was at the um secret garden and dolphin habitat i've been there oh yeah it's pretty awesome where is this it's in vegas oh, okay i can't remember what um hotel it's at but well the mirage is where they performed <sighs> but it's i i feel like they if it's it may be at the mirage right um, I can't remember. It's also possible it was at another place. But anyway, they have like their lions and a couple tigers. They have a bunch of stuff. And it's sad because it's a small zoo. But I'm sure these animals are treated better than the average animal at a zoo. Yeah. But I mean, they're in these enclosed habitats. Well, they get investigated just like modern circuses do. I think they're routine checks by... Yeah. Uh, which government agency is it? Do you remember? The USDA. The USDA does that? They do circuses, zoos, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, the thing is, is if you're an animal welfare group, you, you probably don't think the USDA is doing enough. Yeah. And even if they are following the letter of the law, you probably think the letter of the law isn't strong enough. Yeah. And supposedly every single major circus in the United States has been cited for violating the Animal Welfare Act. Yeah. Um, so I think the whole concept behind lion taming and lion training is fascinating for most people but then you take another step further and you're like these are wild animals in captivity like what are you doing yeah why is your head in its mouth exactly and I th- i'm glad you brought that up because then in the introduction there's a pretty good description of what a lion can do what can a, lion a do? lion's mouth can open up wider than your head is tall a foot 30 uh-huh. centimeters it's also um capable of crushing a bull's spine <laughs> i love that reference that that just sounds tough it is like tough. The spine of a bull. Yeah. Um, and uh, the claws are about three inches long. Pretty serious stuff. So, I mean, yeah, this is very serious stuff if you're a lion trainer. But at the same time, it's like, what, you know, how do you justify having this act? What's the act for? What's it doing? Yeah. Or is it is it protecting? Is it conserving? What is it raising awareness? I think people are demanding more explanation than they did in, say, the time of Clyde Beatty. Well, yeah, because back then it was fun to poke and prod things that you thought were unusual and exotic, and there wasn't a lot of respect for it. Like the initial circuses before there were these acts were, I think they had horse acts, but it was mainly like, look at these animals in cages that you've never seen before. Exactly. And look, there's a pygmy. Yeah. You know? Bearded lady. Right. And that guy stinks. So, um... And I think Isaac Van Jerk was the first guy to put his head in the mouth, too, right? He was. Yeah. Unfortunately... The lion didn't uh, finish that job. Right. Yeah, we have like a whole suite of circus art stuff. Do we? Human Cannonball? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, man, we've got a, we have several others. Circus Arts. Yeah, yeah that's right. what it's called. If you even look on the channel, it's uh, entertainment.howstuffworks.com slash art slash circus arts. Wow. It has a, a sub channel, Circus Arts sub channel at HowStuffWorks, because that's the kind of site it is. And if you go to that sub channel, 
You don't even need to do that. You can go to the search bar on the homepage at HowStuffWorks.com and type in lion taming, and it'll bring up this article. Yeah, I think we I know we talked about something else because I mentioned that I go to the Big Apple Circus when it comes through town. Yeah. I remember talking about that. And that's the one where they have, like, like a horse. They still have the equestrian show and, like, dogs jumping through hoops. But other than that, it's, like, clowns and jugglers and, uh, like, the Cirque du Soleil feats of strength. No animals, no big cats. People on the run from the law. Yeah, it's not like the, the gaudy Ringling Brothers now. Good lord. I haven't seen the circus in. I can't even tell you how long it's You should, been. you and you should check out the Big Apple Circus. Oh yeah? Yeah, it's neat. Alright, we'll check it out. It's like very small and intimate. It's like, it feels like what you might expect a circus a hundred years ago to be like. Will you send me an email when it's coming? I will. Okay. Okay. Uh, I said search bar, by the way. Alright. So that means listener mail? Yeah. This is from, uh, I'm going to call this, um, We Help Someone Kick Heroin. <laughs> Did you read this? Awesome. Um, hey, guys, I've been meaning to write you for a very long time. I've been listening to you pretty much since day one, learning and loving every step of the way. However, it was almost a year ago I chose to check myself into drug treatment. See, I am a Marine, female Marine, uh, no longer active duty. Uh, but when I was injured, I was given a lot of painkillers and ended up getting addicted to those. And that eventually led to me getting strung out on heroin for years. Huh. Uh, what does this have to do with you? Well, heroin detox is one of the worst things you can imagine. Uh, we were not allowed to listen to music or watch TV or pretty much do anything but classes and groups. I agree that it helped me being in a media blackout, but I did beg the staff to let me listen to you guys. To my amazement, my doctor was a fan of yours and approved it. Awesome. So while I was going through the worst of, uh, the worst of it, you were both there with me. I will spare you the details. Uh, so August 15th is we've, not only... I think, I think we've both seen the Seinfeld <laughs> where Elaine's dating the guy who's kicking heroin. Did she date a guy kicking heroin? Yeah, don't you remember? I don't think I remember that we one. We should check that one out. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so now August 15th is not only my birthday, I'm 29 this year, but also my first birthday off drugs. Oh, congratulations. I want to thank you for what you've done for me, and uh, I'm going to go back and listen to them all again. Um, I know it is a lot to ask, but a shout out would make my day. Dude. And Elaine Turley. Elaine, don't tell me that's a coincidence. <laughs> well, it's A. It's spelled with an A. Oh, a Elaine. Okay. Uh, she says Semper Fi from Elaine Turley. That's awesome. And then she says, uh, P.S. Marines are the few and the proud. Female Marines are the fewer and the prouder. Nice. So, way to go, man. Yeah, congratulations. And when I say man, I mean lady. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You kicked uh, heroin with us. That's amazing. Yeah. Can't even think about that. Um, wow, man. That was a mind blower, Chuck. Pretty good one. Uh, if you have a mind blowing story uh, that relates to us, even if it doesn't, that's cool. But if it does, wow, that's even better. Um, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. That's our Twitter handle. Uh, Facebook.com slash stuff you should know is where we dwell on Facebook. Um, you can also send us an email to stuffpodcast at discovery.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 